are there to try to make your life easier. Most people are using computers all day long, so um, you can pull those up at your leisure. Um, we also, probably the biggest thing that we've done this year is, is revamp the return to work policy, and we'll talk about that on the, in a few minutes. Um, but this is a best practice policy document. It was probably half a page, and now it's uh, about four or five pages. So uh, there's a lot of content that was added. Um, and that was, we can really credit ACCG Irma's HR helpline for that because a question came in on the return to work policy and a Quinn and Cronin, Donald Cronin um, of that firm uh, helped us along with Linda Judge um, here and also Julie Johns of Drew Echo Farnham um, to try to make that a better return to work policy. So that's something you'd want to take a look at. Um, and the discount hasn't changed on workers' comp. It's still 7.5% for the January 118 year. So, and if anybody has any questions, we'll go through a little bit more of this in detail. But uh, those are the highlights of the changes. Well, I'm going to switch. Linda, you want to come up here? And you can help talk about the return to work policy, which is this way. Here, I'll just, I'll switch it. Slide in, slide in here. Um, Linda is here because she's the expert on the <laughs> return to work policy. Um, a, a big component of what we did was added in um, a lot of the ADA requirements, um, uh, FMLA, some language around that. And also we tried to make it so it's just not for on-the-job injuries, but it's also for off-the-job off injuries too. So this model return to work policy, it provides a decision tree for the organization. So if you've not taken a look at it, there's a lot of details in there about um, when to do what and, and the process itself. Um, it also requires decision makers to ask um, some of the following questions that we've laid out for you. Um, can the employee's position be modified um, in a way that the limitations are respected? Um, while you're still maintaining the value of the position. Basically, you want to know, does it make financial sense from the county standpoint to pay the employee to perform a modified job? And that modified job could be in the form of um, equipment um, that might be necessary or maybe changing the duties, reduced duties. So uh, make sure you're asking that question. Um, if the answer is no, then maybe there's a vacant position um, for which that employee is qualified, and it might not even be in that department, the same department. It might be uh, somewhere else within the county. Um, so that might be a possibility. And also there might be a special project for which that employee could um, be assigned. And um, it also embraces the best practices um, this new policy does. It basically creates some consistency so that you're not treating people differently. You want to make sure that you've got a well thought out um, process for handling return to work um, because some of these employment um, discrimination lawsuits can be won or lost based upon the criteria and making sure that you're not being discriminatory um, and that you've got a rationale for why you're putting someone through the return to work process. So with that, if, if you've got some things to add on, on the policy itself and then we'll talk about ADA. July 1, 2006. Oh, this was on the form. Someone was asking if the July 1, 2006 form was okay. With the, and I'm not sure which rights. one is the Bill of Rights and then the panel. The Bill of Rights should be July actually, 2006. Actually, it was updated last year. The Bill of Rights is updated generally whenever they update the, um, the compensation rate. Um, and they've been doing that a couple of times, uh, a couple of years in a row. So this one should be J July 2016. There is a, a revision. Okay. And most everybody should have that. Just make sure you do. If you don't, um, request it. I and I think that one is online. It's not in this book, correct? But it is online. The um, panel of physicians is July 1, 2006. If that's what you're asking about. So the panel is July 1, 2006, and the Bill of Rights is July 2016. So, okay. All right, anything you want to talk about in particular on return to work? 
Uh, as far as the, um, you talked first about the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we want to make sure that we maintain control of the medical, so that's very important. Um, if you have some questions about the validity of your panel, um, give me a call, send me an email, um, and we can take a look at it and make sure. Um, we did a lot of revisions recently, and I haven't seen all of them. But, you know, if you have a question, just, you know, feel free to give us a call and we'll handle that. Um, as far as return to work, um, just, you know, most of you do a great job of that. It's not, it, if you have them return to work in a different, on a different shift or in a different job, please know that we will pay the difference in any wages up to a maximum of, I think it's $354 a week. So, you know, if they normally make $500 and now they can only make $250, um, we pay 66 and two-thirds of the difference. So that's a little more of an incentive for them to actually go, go back to work in a job that's going to pay them a little bit less. Okay. Um, and one other, let's see, Dan, one down. Um, ADA, as I mentioned, um, the ADA and the FMLA are terms that are in this new return to work policy, again, because it does apply in on-the-job injuries as well as off-the-job injuries. And um, there was a 2008 amendment to the ADA, and so uh, disability is, can include some medical conditions that are temporary in nature, and I remember Donald Cronin talking about back injuries in particular. Um, so, you know, that may come into play for a workers' comp situation. Um, and then uh, many of these injured workers desiring to return to work will be disabled within the meaning of the ADA. So um, you just want to make sure that you're trying to accommodate them unless doing so would put an undue hardship on the organization. Um, so, you know, this is an extremely important area, but, uh, you know, if you you'd like to present this maybe to your HR director, I know we've got some HR directors on the call, um, then this would be an important policy you might want to take a look at. Um, we have a question, how do we add or delete approved physicians on the panel of physicians? Um, you can, David Burgey here is the contact, or you can contact me directly. Um, I'm Linda Judge. At, uh, ljudge at accg.org. Um, you can send me a copy of what you have, and we can work through that. Okay. And I'll send everyone's email address and contact information that's on the phone right now. Okay. I don't think I've missed any other questions. Okay. You want to come back, Dan? Yep, yeah, I'll come I'll back. That, please. Thank you, Linda. Everybody, you, Linda. applaud for Linda. <laughs> so, as we went on, anybody have any questions? Thank you. Who is a uh, Marie Tavern? Uh, we answered that. Uh, that so you, that was good. That was good to recognize that she's done that. So it's good. Very good. Go through these and delete. So, anybody else have any questions? I'm going to just reach out and see how you guys are doing out there. Appreciate over there. Jane, Jane, are you're out there? Les, Lester, Lester, Lester. Lester. Mm -hmm. Jane. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Are you? Uh, Getting anything from the presentation thus far? Oh yes, I am. Um, I have not done the updated return to work policy, and I'm thinking I probably need to do that really soon. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Any other questions? Not yet. Thank but you. But I'm going to ask if I do. Believe me. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, Jane. Well, let's continue on uh, again. These are requirements for both the work comp and the IRMA program. As of the book, first bullet point is reps suggest a three-ring binder. So all of our, our reps that, that do this on a regular basis, Steve Shields and John McIntyre and Chris Ryan and Natalie Sellers, 
I'll say that the, you know when to make it smooth, go smoothly is get a three ring binder, and then based on all the questions, have it uh, the binder divided up on what the category is and have the documentation ready for them. That's really what they're what they look at. They should be looking at some other things, but we're going to talk about that. It makes it easy to organize. Uh, you can do it in whatever way you want to do that uh, in documentation, but that's what they're suggesting. Uh, the safety coordinator appointment, again, expected for everyone to have a safety coordinator appointed by uh, really the county uh, commissioners. And as again, you can see the county, there's a, uh, within the packet itself is a safety coordinator resolution uh, that uh, approval by the commissioners uh, there. It has some roles and responsibilities on there. And again, I think it's really up to the county as a whole. Uh, you can divide those roles and responsibilities up, whatever makes uh, more sense. If you want to have one person handle it or have multiple people. But having that safety coordinator have overall uh, overall uh, uh, oversight of that process. Okay. Um, the, uh, again, one of the expectations of that safety coordinator is they're going to have safety coordinator training. And we have... Uh, actually four or five different modules, but we expect the safety coordinators to have at least one through module one through four, three right now. And the expectation is that if you haven't had those previously, you're going to take at least one a year until that expectation is completed. So a uh, pretty simple... Uh, you lost your sound. I lost my sound. Let's see. See, first of all, let's see. So can anybody raise your hand if you can hear me? So Holly Stevenson can. Looks like we got a lot of different people. Let me see. Uh, Bill Gay. Bill Gay, are you out there? Can you hear me? You're saying you can't hear me. Bill, raise your hand if you can hear me. It looks like you've lost your connection. We don't have any audio on you. So uh, you might want to check your connection. And let's continue on. Hopefully it'll pop in back for him. Uh, let's see. And Cynthia had safety coordinator modules one, two, or three. Are they required each year? Okay, I answered that. Thank you for your question. And I still hear. That's good. Thank you for your questions and or comments. Uh, the quarterly safety meetings. So the, the reps will be there. They'll be looking to see if you've had four distinct quarterly safety meetings. They'll look for dates. They'll look for topics. They'll look for attendees of those particular uh, meetings. But again, we I really hope you're not going through the motions in regards to this. This is a very valuable way to disseminate information. Make sure I would love to see all your employees have some type of quarterly safety meeting where uh, people are, are uh, talking about specific topics that add value to their day-to-day -day work activity. Uh, make sure that uh, you're, you're documenting those, but utilize them not just to talk about maybe some training topics, talk about what's going on within your within your organization, incidents you've had, lessons learned, things that you've learned from outside the organization. Talk about webinars that will continue to have similar to this. Somebody had a question, Chrissy Hudson, if we already have one and three, would five or four be required this year? No, those are not required. If you've already taken one through three, you're not required to have any more than that. Although, if you can attend those, I do think they'll provide some level of value. What we're attempting to do is uh, it, it really up, right, uh, really increase the professionalism of some of the safety coordinators and get a little bit more higher level information. So if you have that ability to attend, I would suggest that you do that. Uh, coordinate safety training and implement safety uh, rules. Again, basic expectation is that you need to make sure you're uh, near the job site that you're posting uh, what should happen in case of an on-the-job accident. Uh, but, you know, making sure that people are trained, they have the appropriate training to do their particular job, making sure that there are rules out there specific to employees, that those are posted, that the employees review those, uh, that they're going through that. Uh, that's very, very critical to the re risk reduction process. Coordinate safety inspections. 
again, the expectation, we'd love to see that you can complete a safety inspection on, on all departments and all specific issues that are hazardous. So if you have vehicles or you have equipment that require inspections, put those as part of the, the expectation. But at the very least, looking to see a general expectation or a general safe self-inspection of your work sites twice a year. Uh, again, and also looking to see if you've not only identified things, but you've worked to follow up, follow up in regards to those identified issues for corrective action. So have you taken care of uh, those issues that are identified? Doing an inspection without doing corrective action really doesn't provide a lot of value to, uh, to these organizations. And, 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 and in private industry, if you did that, if OSHA were to walk in, that would be proof that you have a, a deficiency in your process. And, and lastly, and again on this page, we want to make sure you're reviewing all of your incidents and or accidents. So if you have a worker's compensation claim or a property liability claim, want to see some oversight of that process. What was the root cause of those particular incidents? What corrective action should we put in place? There should be some review process that we can observe uh, to ensure that those things are being taken care of. Any questions or comments from this page or section? Okay, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Again, these are continue to be requirements for both IRMA and work comp. An employee must attend a minimum of one LGRMS administrative training session. So this has been a kind of a confusing thing over the years, and we really want to clarify it. These bullet points add that. So it has to be in addition to the safety coordinator training. So if you have a new safety coordinator training or a new safety coordinator and they attend one safety coordinator session, that does not meet the minimum requirements. That You have to have another session. This is the biggest cause of not receiving the discount. When they go through uh, the process of reviewing these, this is probably one of the biggest deficiencies. So I would really suggest that you work to take care of that as soon as possible. Again, training must be scheduled and completed by September 15th. Uh, so we'd love to see you attend our regional training. We have those offered and you can look at those at lgrms.com and our training calendar and that's all the training that we offer uh, throughout the year. We update that uh, probably on a monthly basis uh, based on the end of the year. But we also approve on-site uh, uh, courses that are approved by the field rep. So if your field rep is Steve Shields and he provides training or somebody else from outside provides training and he approves that, that that's going to count. But it's got to be approved by the field rep. So if we come in and do a 15-minute uh, toolbox talk, that is probably not going to be uh, an approved site. But if we come in and do a DDC class or do something uh, else, uh, where we provide training, that is going to be improved. We want you to be able to utilize our resources to ensure that you're reducing risk within your organization. Again, attending health and wellness and or any of our online courses do not apply. So if you go to a health and wellness workshop, if you attend one of our online courses through local GovU, that does not apply uh, for the training requirements. So, those are all issues that we've had in the past, all questions, we wanted to clear those things up. Uh, responded writing to LGRMS recommendations within 90 days. So we don't expect every recommendation we, we write to be taken care of within 90 days, but you at least need to respond to it, uh, addressing what those issues are and letting us know what your plan is. Again, on some of these things, uh, you might not have the resources to respond, you might have to do an administrative control, but we would like to see a response on each and every recommendation uh, that the field rep makes. Again, implement and oversee the drug-free workplace program. You want to make sure that all employees uh, uh, have, or that all that's on every employment application, uh, that notice that you are a, a drug-free workplace. And then that you want to make sure that there's a written workplace or a drug-free workplace policy. Uh, and again, we have a model program or model policy in the Appendix B of this particular handout. And then lastly, the seatbelt policy. Again, I can help provide those. We have available seatbelt policies also. But having a policy alone is really not the important thing. This is a thing 
where you are actually saving lives and livelihoods of your employees. And having a policy doesn't necessarily do everything you need. You need to, one, communicate that policy, make sure employees know what that expectation. You need to train employees. Now, tr telling people that they have to wear their seat belts is not considered training, or at least not quality training. Bringing people in, and again, this is not necessarily where, where to look at, but I would just su highly suggest bring people in. Talk about the importance of your seatbelt policy. Reiterate the importance of that seatbelt policy. Talk about the value to your organization and the value to your employees. Talk about the consequences of failing to follow the seatbelt policy. So if you have a seatbelt policy but there are no consequences from failing to follow that policy, what does that say to your employees? From my perspective, it says we don't really care that much about your seatbelt policy. So have consequences, whether it's some type of suspension or written warning or, or termination, whatever that be, whether that might be. If you don't have consequences, it's really not that important to your organization. And then ultimately, holding people accountable. Again, uh, uh, making sure people know that that's important to your organization. So we're going to talk about property and liability expectations and the discounts associated with that. Before we get into that, I really wanted to talk about where your losses are within property and liability over the last three years. So these numbers match up with the numbers on the first slide that I had. And as you can see here, within sheriffs, jails, and police, again, that's law enforcement focused, we have about 39% of all total incurred for uh, property and liability. Uh, almost 22, uh, 21 million dollars associated with that. 22 million dollars. Uh, roads, public works, all kind of combined together, looking at about 14% uh, of uh, total incurred, uh, and uh, you're looking at uh, somewhere around 8 million dollars. Then fire and EMS, you're looking at about. Uh, uh, I'm having a hard time reading the slide, but about 10% of total incurred, about 6 million dollars. So this is where our issues are, and, and historically speaking, I think we've done a pretty good job on some aspects, some departments, and I think some departments we have the opportunity. And again, I would say that was within law enforcement. If you look at category, law, uh, property liabilities by category, motor vehicles are our biggest opportunities, whether it's claims within our law enforcement groups or throughout the county, we have about 37% of all of our property liability claims are related to motor vehicle claims. About $21 million of that $56 million total incurred costs. Uh, property, again, don't have a lot of control of that unless you have the ability to control the weather. A lot of our claims, although one big chunk of that is related to fire, uh, which we're doing some things on. And then it's law enforcement liability, and that's 17% of total incurred at about $10 million. Down the list, you have HR, human resources. This is discrimination, uh, EEOC claims, hiring, firing, harassment claims. About 3% of the, of the total incurred at about $2 million. And then roads liability, again, 3%, about $2 million. Historically speaking, and again, Ashley can probably talk more to this than I can, but I think those numbers have been higher. But because we focused on both HR and on roads and streets, I think we've been able to reduce those numbers. And again, it, so it just shows you the work that you've been doing has some impact in regards to this. Ashley, got any comments on that? Um, I would agree with you. I think a lot of the training that LGRMS has put on and the work that you guys are doing to try to minimize your auto accidents, that has had a huge impact. I would also tell you maybe some of that is due to the fact that we have had some counties in the past by higher limits for motor vehicles, and they have reduced um, their their limits on the motor vehicle. The minimum requirement is less than a million dollars, so I think that also has helped reduce some of the payouts on vehicle accidents. If you look at requirements for just the, the property liability or IRMA discount, Again, MVRs for all employees that drive county vehicles or members' vehicles, that's very, very important. Uh, and we'll look at that. We'll do a random check to make sure that you're doing that. Uh, personnel policies, I'm not going to go through these. This is We've done this for several years, uh, and they're fairly self-known. You have, again, hiring, firing, a motor vehicle. 
motor vehicle should really cover what do you do, you know, what, what's your measure of success, what are you doing for maintenance of your vehicles, uh, how do you inspect your vehicles, uh, what do you do after an incident with a motor vehicle, what do you do for training for employees, what do you do for the, uh, MVR checks, things to that effect. That's what a motor vehicle policy is going to contain. This is where we had some new policies last year, and this is within the Sheriff's uh, Policy Manual and the Jail. These are two issues or items that I was told last year we had some opportunity with. So I think the, the hiring and termination and those top line issues, I think we've kind of taken care of, but the motor vehicle operation, pursuits, use of force, arrests, internal, internal affairs, are all policies, if you looked at that 17% of losses are related to uh, police operation and or motor vehicle within police and or the law enforcement groups, the sheriff's office. So those are, uh, that's an expectation and we're going to set a higher expectation last year. I think we introduced it, we put it out there, but we're going to hold, be holding people more accountable to this. So work with your sheriff's office, work with your police departments, work with uh, your jails, and then within the county jail system, again, we're recommending that you do a staffing analysis really to determine how many people that you need within your jails to staff that based on the population. It's a recommendation, but I think it's very valuable uh, to help reduce liability there. Where we see our biggest causes, our biggest claims within jails, inmate medical, a lot of denial claims, so making sure you have processes and procedures uh, for inmate medical, that's going to assist you in regards to reducing those claims. Jail suicide, making sure you have processes and procedures to prevent jail suicides, and then ultimately civil rights. This, maybe go ahead. back on the inmate medical too. If you do have third-party contractors for inmate medical, make sure they're they're responsible for their insurance, and that you get evidence that they have the coverage. Um, you don't want to be held uh, holding the bag if they do not have their own coverage. So I'm going to reach out to somebody. I'm going to go talk to. I'm going to talk to Suzanne Pittman since she's easily accessible. Suzanne, are you out there? And Kevin. And Kevin. Suzanne, I get you. Have, you guys are on mute. You have yourself on mute, I think. Well, this is a good way to avoid the question. I'll go to the next person. Uh, let's see. What about Pamela? Uh, Pamela Maxwell. Pamela Maxwell, are you out there? She's I'm going to go to... Linda Woodson, Linda Woodson, are you out there? Linda, well, uh, either we're having phone difficulties or people are sleeping. I'm not sure which one that is. I, I'm going to say it's phone difficulties. <laughs> I'm going to go to Kim Strickland. Kim Strickland, are you out there? Kim, can you hear me? Okay. Kim, are you out there? Now, this is not working well. One more try. Oh, I don't have my mic on. Sorry. Okay, Kim. That's a good that's a good Hi, good comment. Thank you. You are off the <laughs> go. Joyce Norris. Joyce Norris, are you out there? I am. How are you today, Joyce? I'm good. Where are you calling from? Washington County. How are things in Washington? It's there at Washington County, Sandersville. It's it's a beautiful day. Very, very, very good. Very good, Joyce. Any questions? Anything uh, we haven't provided clarity on that you want to know more about? No, but I do have a comment. Um, this just came out this week, the personnel liability seminars, and they're going to go over that new return to work policy at that seminar. Correct. So People might be interested in attending to hear that. Great, you, Joyce. Joyce, that is so fantastic. Where can I send <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. That's great. 
Uh, you're <laughs> absolutely right. So the personnel li personnel liability, all fantastic information. Reed Gillette uh, and his uh, group, Ellery Thompson, are, are providing that train. They'll probably have a variety of different uh, attorneys provide that. Uh, but uh, they will be going through that return to work process uh, and talking about it in depth there. So great, great comment. Thank you, Joyce. You're welcome. I'm going to have to call on you again. <laughs> well, I'm, kind of I'm telling you. Uh, again, going on specific requirements for workers' compensation, you have to have the panel of physicians and the Bill of Rights. You have to have a signature for each employee uh, that they've reviewed those. They have to be posted and maintained in a prominent place. Uh, again, re return to work policy, we've talked about that. And then the safety action plan. So this was a big thing that we implemented last year, and this was really supposed to give us a lot of traction in regards to reducing injuries. Again, we started off kind of slowly last year and really want to make sure we're, we're doing a great job of it in 2017. Ashley did a great job of updating uh, the actual format. You can find this at uh, the same place as the other documents are. Uh, and it, again, kind of goes through the same, what are your departments that you have the opportunities with? Uh, I've done a couple of different presentations on one on work comp, and one on property and liability from the overall pool uh, and showed where you should be focusing on. And what I'm suggesting is if you have a smaller county or a smaller organization, you don't have a lot of losses, Maybe you look at the pool as a whole and say, this is where we should be focusing. Uh, and you can kind of combine the two. Uh, again, kind of the same format as individual, based on the departments that you've identified and or offices that you've identified as your focus. What's the, the most frequent loss type? And then what actions are you going to take uh, to address that? We're, I'm not going to go too much more in depth than this. Uh, we're going to go over this a little later in June. Uh, again, it talks about the purpose. I'm going to go through that later. Uh, but we will uh, be doing another webinar that's really focused on the action planning process, on, uh, on the loss analysis process in, in June of uh, 2017. Uh, and, and if you have any questions in the interim, we want to make sure that you, are, uh, th that you have answers to those. But really, we're not looking for miracles to happen. We're looking for you to identify where your issues are and start the process to, to work towards reducing those particular incidents. Um, and as long as you have a plan, look at your policies, uh, look, at your, uh, uh, look at your training, uh, look at your, uh, uh, again, accountability systems, and make sure that uh, everything is in place and you're working towards it. And if you're doing that, that's all we can expect. Ashley, anything else you want to talk about? Maybe just to add, as far as the timing goes, because we just kicked this off last year, what you should be working on right now are the action plans that you created last fall. So still continue to work those plans. And then in June, um, actually, I think we'll do it end of July. Okay. I mean, end of June, we will send the loss run so that in July, you can work on your new action plan. And that will be with the template that we just showed you. And there is a spot there to talk about the, um, pro the progress that you've made over the last 12 months. So that is why that form is a little bit different this year, but we do just want to make clear that you know, that's going to be a little bit later. That will be in July. Um, but So you should be working on last year's plan right now still. Correct. Correct. Thank you, Ashley. So in conclusion, again, things that you really need to look out for out of all this making sure you have the verification forms into uh, uh, <laughs> into vetting uh, by September 15th. Uh, again, making sure that you know that you have a panel of physicians frequently asked questions and the Bill of Rights are updated on the ACCG website, and you have the address there, uh, that you have the return to work policy, the new policy that's been updated. Again, utilizing that. Uh, ensure that the an employee attends a minimum of one LGRMS administrative training session. And again, some exceptions to that, or but it has to be in addition to the safety coordinator training. Focus on, work with your sheriff's offices, work with your jails to ensure they have an updated policy manual to include those expectations. And again, having the policy, uh, that's just one part. They have to be working the policy. Again, I'd much rather have 
a, a one-page policy or a one-sentence policy that they're working versus having a 25-page policy that they've never seen before. So uh, again, that's the value in this process. And then ultimately, uh, the safety action pro process. Again, continue to work your plans uh, until the mid part of the year, and then the expectation is you will update those plans and, and add new items for 2017 and beyond. I'm going to open it up for questions or comments, and I'm going to allow these uh, my lovely co-host to make any comments. Anybody have any questions or comments? All clear. Uh, not sure. <laughs> not sure. Anybody else? I'm going to pull one person up and see if we have anything. Stephanie Walker, are you out there? Did you say Stephanie Walker? Hey, Stephanie. Uh, how are you? Anything else? Any questions from us? No, sir. I don't have any. Thanks. I'm going to put you on hold again. So, Ashley, anything in addition you want to, uh, to ask or talk about before we go? No, I do want to make sure and, and thank you to Linda for pointing out the um, the Bill of Rights. If you will go online, there should be the July 1, 2016 version online, so make sure you grab that one and make sure that one is posted um, in a prominent location or multiple prominent locations throughout the county. Uh, again, here's a question from Becky Miller. Uh, it says, I just finished uh, taking the third part of the safety coordinator class, and which one should I take next? Uh, uh, work at a library. So again, I'm not sure how many co other courses that you've taken, Stephanie. Uh, I, again, one, two, three, I would take first, and then uh, when we offer four and or five, I would, you know, again, they don't necessarily have to go in sequence. It's really about you. The safety coordinator one is probably the best one to take. It's an overview of everything uh, that we have. But the the ones after that, you can uh, you can take at any time. Becky Miller, just workers' compensation class. Not sure. That was related to your okay. question. Our question. Okay. Let's see if I can find Stephanie. Uh, Penny, anything you want to talk about? Yes, I would like to talk about the safety verification form. There seems to be some confusion. I don't know if you can see this, but if you belong to the IRMA program or to the workers' comp program and you are a county, those are the two forms that you would fill out and send to us. What page is that on, Penny? That is on page 18, 18 and, and 19. 19. However, if you are an authority, that is the water and sewer authorities, developmental authorities, libraries, all you have to do, and you belong to the workers' comp program, then you just fill out that particular form on page 21. If you are an IRMA member and you are an authority, you do not need to worry about filling out any forms because this doesn't apply to you. Very good. You only need to fill out one form per program. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Penny. Thank you. Linda, anything else you'd like to add? Um, as far as returning to work, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, you as an employer need to look across department lines when you're looking for light duty work for the employees. Um, make a list of projects or little tasks that people can do um, that perhaps that department may be short-staffed then they can't get to. Just have a bank of items that can be done and just open up the department lines and go back and forth. Very good. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you everyone out there. I'm going, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to close it out today. Uh, I'm going to send you all a thank you email, and within that email, I'll send you the presentation itself. I'll also send you contact information for all the participants here uh, at the uh, Peachtree Corner offices. 
Uh, if you, but if you have any questions, you definitely can email me anytime. Uh, you can uh, give me a call and be more than happy to help you out in, in whatever ways we can. So thank you so much. Enjoy the beautiful day in Georgia. Thank God we are living in Georgia uh, versus <laughs> other parts of the world and country. And uh, you guys have a fantastic rest of the day and week. Thank you.